fixes it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Rock, can I actually just start it? So it's going. You just need to turn it off when you're done. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I think it's close enough to 1030. Um, you've got a sheet that you can jot some things down if you want to, but we're going to be talking fast. We have a couple of short video clips to show you during our session. But since uh, this session is about clear learning targets, we thought we should start with clear learning targets for um, what we're going to be doing in here. And most of the time when I'm doing learning targets, I don't have more than one. Occasionally I'll have two, but we got a lot of things that we're, we want to cover in this 20 minutes. So I've got three learning targets up here, and they're also here if you uh, need to see them better. Um, I can distinguish between learning targets and learning activities. The second is that I can develop learning targets that are aligned to state standards. And the third, I can develop a scale so students and I can monitor their progress toward the target. And also in design question one, it talks about celebrating successes. And we may or may not get to that, so uh, we didn't put that up there as um, one of our goals. So the first thing that we need to do is figure out what the difference is between a learning target and a learning activity. And um, Roxanne is going to talk about that. And you've got your Marzano books. Yes. If you have your Marzano book, if you turn to page 18, that would be great. If you don't, you can share with the neighbor. And on that chart, on, on page 18, it shows, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but it does show some different activities and the goal that goes with it. Noticing that the activities are things that the students will actually be doing compared to the goal, which is what you want them to learn by doing those activities. So just a simple way, um, when we do, especially in the lower elementaries, it's hard to put the big words and all that up there, but some of the activities kind of coordinate with that. And so they're kind of, um, for the lower elementary, it's, it's harder to put all the words, the verbiage like we have here. Our kids was, just can't grasp that much. So when we do our learning targets, we make them a lot shorter, but you still have the activities to go with that. So that's just kind of saying the difference between activities and goals. And when they come into my room, the learning target is always right here. And the activities, which is probably more what they want to know, they want to know what we are, what are we doing today, what kinds of activities. And I always have those listed there with whatever assignment goes with it. But the learning target is the thing that they're going to have to write down when they come into the class. So um, what we would like you to do right now is find an elbow partner, somebody close by that um, you can think about a learning target that you have and um, an activity that would go along with that target just so that we can help you make a distinction between a learning activity and a learning target or learning goal. We'll give you a couple of minutes to share with a partner, talk about something that you do in your classroom. Oh, do you uh, change like a target every day? Yeah, so for me, you know, sometimes I have six targets in a chapter, sometimes I well, so usually, 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 yeah. Sometimes they spend a couple of days on a target. Actually, um, and sometimes my targets are pretty. Last Friday, he was talking about making them too specific, and so I was concerned that some of them may be too specific. So, but so let's see, for two weeks, doing all of something different. We are doing the next day. So I have, I can't line up. So I would have two targets. I have to change it every time. I have to change it. Yeah, I think a seventh grader is going to help them with the target themselves. I have to do it. So sometimes they call me on it. Like, our comprehension topic is to look up and it doesn't sound like anything we've been doing. Then they have to do the activity. I do not play. And it's kind of nice that you do that. When I had, I used to have seven, seven, seven to get them in the right grade in the afternoon, and I didn't have to worry about that, but now I have to be too slow in Ideally, I need two targets. I need one on that side, and so I can keep a separate grade target and I need to be able to do a comprehension. I like to stay standard. Um, yeah. 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 Ye
Okay, we're going to wrap up the conversations. <coughs> Heard some very good conversations. Good question Brian had if, if she changes these every day or uh, Amy also asked about different classes. Good questions. She said you did change. Mm -hmm. She changes from 7th to 8th grade. Um, your targets, though, might stay the same for a week with 7th grade. Yeah, it, d it just depends. I don't think we've usually had the same target for a whole week, but um, maybe two days, and so occasionally three days, just depends on the content. But I do have seventh and eighth graders are doing different things, so I have to remember to change those out when a different group comes in. Right, and for the elementary, our whole group, usually that stays the same, usually a two week period. And so the goal will stay the same, maybe activities will change to go with that goal, but like math usually changes every day. So that, that does change. Word work is usually a week long. And so some of it will change and some of it won't. And the kids will keep you on top of that. Because, oh, are we doing the same thing we did yesterday? You haven't changed it. So yeah, be aware of that. That's true. I also, on mine, I, I do the red targets so that the little drawn ones look like this. <laughs> so if anybody wants copies of that, and then I laminate that so that the kiddos see that this is important stuff. And we also make sure when I'm teaching the lesson, refer back to the board. And at the time, you know, if they see if kiddos aren't paying attention, you know, ask them, and they either have to go to the board if they can't read it, they go to the board and point to it, and we talk about that, but referring to that several times throughout the lesson, especially whole group when it's harder to keep all 20 kiddos on target. Um, one of the things that I refer to a lot is in the, you know, those sheets that we've got that have all the design questions on there, and the, the teacher evidence usually is seems like it's pretty easy to do, but um, the way you want to find out if you're doing it well is to look at the student evidence. So when asked, students can explain the learning goal for the lesson. So when somebody comes and talks to <coughs> you, uh, one of the things that I've noticed that Brad will do is ask, you know, he'll be over there talking to the kids and asking them, well, what is it you're doing to them? And they can usually tell you the activity, but um, they may or may not be able to, you know, identify the target, but if it's posted on the board, if they forgot what they're in there for, then uh, they can refer to it. And when I'm done with a learning target, especially if it's all in the same chapter, I take it, you know, whatever the target was yesterday, and I kind of just move them off to the side, and so they'll have all this stuff around the target, that w whatever we've been working on for that unit, and I always leave it up there until the very end, until the test is over. Um, and you know, then we'll move on to the next one. And then they keep track of that. Okay, I'm gonna make sure I'm not jumping ahead here. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've got a couple of, uh, couple of short little videos that. Well, how many targets do you have in the chapter on that? Um, eight, 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 probably. This So this is something that has been just really effective in our classroom. We have on our whiteboard a box that says Swabot. 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 Students will well, well, be able to be able to capitalize. Capitalize. Proper nouns. Proper nouns. Swabot. Swabot. Swabot stands for students will be able to. And it states what our objective or our learning goal is for a particular lesson. Swabot. I will say and write the objective and students will repeat it. Identify. It sort of has a, a rhythmic tone to it. It just signals to students' brains, okay, this is our goal for the next 15, 30, 45 minutes. What do I capitalize? The more we can be transparent with students, the more we model metacognition and we get them thinking about their own thinking and learning, we also help them become more effective. Swim back, swim back. But how powerful. I mean, if they hear that over and over and over, it becomes a rhythm and a rhyme, and then they know, okay, this is important. I must need to hear that. And I always use I can statements in my learning targets because I want them to make it personal 
And, yeah, and at elementary, that's also something that's easy for them to remember. This uh, video is less. In, in All right, I'm going to be sharing with you some ways that I utilize I can ideas. statements to provide clear targets for students. So one of the things that I would do is utilize ICANS that would be directly from the outcomes in the program, Alberta Program of Studies. We would either create those ICANS collaboratively as a grade level team in some situations, depending on the uh, school I was in, or I've also gone ahead and done them on my own uh, for other subjects as well. But I want to share a few ways that I did it. So one of the things that I would do, and this one was specifically from grade five language arts, is I would share the ICANN right at the start of the lesson. We put that right up and then talk about how today for that particular situation, I can use background knowledge to help me understand. So we talk about that and then at the end we'd check back and I'd either use a uh, fist to five technique of five. I really think I can do that all the way down to one. Um, I'm, I'm really unsure how I can do that. Sometimes we'd use a one, two, three, three, I really get it, two kind of, one not really. Um, we'd also use other ways to figure out how, where the kids are at for it. Um, this is an example from grade three mathematics where I would show and I can so for instance, you can see the first one, I can measure length. There's an example of what that looked like. And then the kids would color it in for green piece of cake, yellow tough, but I think I can do it, and red not yet. Occasionally the kids would utilize this, especially at the end of a unit two, to do that self-assessment, and I would use that as well. But again, the ICANN made a really clear target for students. Um, here's another example. This is another grade three math that they would use. to say whether they, they've gotten that or not. Then another thing that I would do, and this is, again, at that grade three level, is we would post up the ICANs on a now playing board, a bulletin board in the room for ones that we were working on currently. And then, I don't know if you can see this, courtesy of Bob the Builder, can we do it? Yes, we can. This would go up on the wall, and as a group, when we had accomplished ICANs, um, they would go up on the wall, and then that would be that record for me to be able to refer back to them, uh, really clear targets. Then when building assessments for students, we put the ICANN, or I would put those ICANs right on the assessment um, to the side, and then a question um, right beside it. So the kids would be able to relate, okay, that's the ICANN statement of what I should be able to do, and now here's the question that's asking me uh, how to do that. So again, we would make those targets really clear uh, for the kids and then... Okay. All right, so developing the targets is probably the most challenging thing. You, once you figure out in your room where you're going to put them, how you're going to communicate uh, to the students the importance of them, but you have to use the state standards to develop your targets. And I have uh, I didn't make copies for everybody, but the, we've got the science table of specifications, and all of my students have a copy of this, and I actually borrowed this from Kendra Craven, so I can't pull it up the science standards, obviously, but this method. Um, so the kids have this, and it's three hole punch, they keep it in their binder all year, and whenever we put a, a learning target up on the board, then it, their job is, they have this piece of paper, um, let's see. Can everybody see that? It's kind of hard to see. But they have a worksheet that's got this information, this blank. Yeah. And they've got, uh, you know, the class. And we have little mini textbooks for each unit. So they have to write down which textbook it's in and then what chapter we're on. And so they put the date down. And if we do more, th uh, more than one day on a learning target, I don't make them write it down again. But I do make them check to make sure that the same learning target is what they have on their paper. And so I give them the target, they put the date down. What their job is to look up in the table of specifications which indicator they think that it fits under, okay? And sometimes that's really easy for them to do and sometimes uh, not so easy. And they usually know which section we're in. And, um, you know, but as we get through towards the end of the chapter, they, they know right where to go in this thing. But they have to fill in which indicator, A, B, C, D, or F, um, and so that way that they know 
that it is aligned, you know, it's a state standard. There's a reason why we're doing this. And um, as I go in and explain an activity, then I also tell them why it is we're doing the activity and how that supports our learning target. Um, with the elementary, again, this would not probably be an option. Uh, the way we aligned ours, we went to the State Department of Ed and got, these are the math, there's language arts, there's science. And so we coordinated ours in our lesson plans. You have that slide too, the lesson plan? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, and so when we're writing our lesson plans for the week, we put right in there, I know it's not very neat, but it works. We put right here our, the state standard that matches the activities that we're doing. And so they always have that. We have that in our information. Um, if you want kid-friendly, um, here's some kid-friendly language, also from the State Department. It has it right on there. Kid-friendly language of, I can use the writing process to publish my writing. Goes along with 2.2.1. And so it has kid-friendly and also. But we put things in our lesson plans, and then like down at the bottom there's vocabulary. Obviously the vocabulary would be the same all week long because that's the same target that we have. So that's just the way we have it. We have it in our lesson plans. We did all the work last year. Same activities then for this year, we'll be able to do that. But some of it correlates, some of it, you know, will change as we go along. But that's the way we keep track of that. Can you share with them the state standards and say, hey, mm -hmm. you do. Yeah, that's what they, I, that's they had that copy of the that table of specifications. I don't, with the, with the lower kiddos, they don't, I mean, as simple as we can keep it, this is all they ever see. This is for us, that we know we're aligning the two together. And when they get to middle school, uh, again, that table of specifications is teacher language, but they're able to figure out, you know, how to match that up to. Um, right, are there that. any, is in the elementary, did the learning targets progress as far as like identifying and stuff? Is there, or is it just over to middle school where they start jumping up? <clears throat> uh, I guess I don't understand. Well, like were you identifying the, mm -hmm. the state standard and stuff? Right. Is everybody on the same page in the elementary doing that way? And it's when they hit sixth grade, here they start. Okay. Breaking it back further. Okay. Right, right. Okay. Um, oh. We've got uh, in your Marzano book, there's, so you've got that kid friendly scoring. Right. I, this yeah. is also, I took a writing class this summer. And so then, you know, when you get to the scoring guides and you want to, to have different, you know, I'm at a zero, I'm at a one, two, three, four. This, in this class that I took this summer, did a great job. This is breaking writing down just the organization piece. This is the teacher language. They also have kid-friendly. So as you are meeting with those kiddos individually, you can talk to them about where they think they are, you know, and it's got kid-friendly language on there. It shows, it tells them, you know, oh, here, I have stuff on my paper, but it's not in order. Okay, so some of the kids will think, oh yeah, that's where I'm at. As you get up here further, I have details, some of them don't fit. So that probably in those individual conferences with your kiddos, kid friendly, but also the teacher friendly. Where did you get the So I took a class this summer and this was for oh, class. And yeah, you're and, it, it, when we go back. and I and it has everything, all the writing pieces, all six and it has them all broken down. So yes, I do have copies. Anybody wants copies of this? Um, so when I, I went through the Marzano training two summers ago, and this was the part that's the most challenging for me, developing a scale rubric for each learning target. And in science, we have so many learning targets, and it, I would just be, you'd just be writing all the time and the kids would you know trying to manage all of those different scales and rubrics so i borrowed from uh, kylie pinner a general scale and you can see that it's um, a fist is the zero fist to four and so that it's it can be applied to any learning target that we're on and so most of the kids don't ever have a total fist because that's the hump, you know, I don't, I don't have any idea what this is about, but occasionally in the pre-assessment, some of them are at that level, but uh, we can break everything down and I usually verbally tell them, okay, so if you're 
like we're doing on Monday, um, distinguishing between qualitative and quantitative observations. Okay, so if they have no idea what an observation is, then they would be at a zero. But I can explain, well, if you know what an observation is, but you really don't, uh, aren't very good at making them, or you don't understand the difference between qualitative and quantitative, maybe you, you're at a one. Um, and then they rate themselves that way. And, and that scales up there all the time. Um, but, but your book has some examples of more yeah. specific 19 scales. to 21. Yeah. And then the sheet that I just handed out, I'm sorry, we're just kind of yeah, out of time. The sheet that I handed out is a very basic scale that you could fill in your your targets and kind of make them. And I know in the book book also they do the 1.5 to 2.5 to kind of break it up because sometimes the kiddos are in between those things. So that's just another idea. We were going to have you try to fill one out, but okay. yeah, we're going to have time for that. So, um, do you what, find your kids are honest about that? That they will tell you, yeah, I do get it. I just see elementary. When you, you do that too, Roxanne, mm -hmm. elementary would just say, oh, yeah, I did. You know, because um, everybody else has it for us. I've been the last couple of years. And, and mine was mine. like, you know, the, the final one is I get it and I can teach it to someone else. Yeah. I thought they were pretty yeah. honest. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. I feel like they if they know. understand, the trouble is, it, do they truly understand what they're, what you're trying to teach okay. them and try to I mean, I have ones that would be like, I don't okay. get it. Right. I, yeah. Talk yeah. to me about and it. And open that conversation. Well, yeah. yeah. And that's not the only way that I yeah. assess them. But because you can also do, um, I'm going to just jump my hand up here. Yeah. You've got, uh, let's see, informal assessments. You do the yeah. to four exit tickets. Um, what Kylie does is have them put a little post-it note and with their name on, I don't know, I can't remember if she hasn't put their mm -hmm. name on it, but she hasn't put a post-it note, and they write down the things that they have specific questions about. They rate themselves and they put the post-it note wherever they think they are, and so she kind of gets a, a visual of where, if everybody's over on this side, then, yeah. you know, the next she's day right. she's going to have to, you know, and we do, I do a lot of thumbs up, um, oh, maybe not yeah. so well, you know, and, and they're pretty honest, you know, so, but I'm not really not getting it. So. Okay, um, we're going to, I guess, go to, let's go to the yeah. This is um, the, a video that a, a teacher made about, what can happen if you don't post your,